I had a dream last night that I was late for this class and I was running and running and running and I ended up back at my office. <laughs> so I think I should start off slowly. Um, according to the lists of people who are registered, there's not enough room in the class. So I'm going to be taking attendance for the first couple of weeks to uh, try to sort that out. Um, my guess is that there's a lot of people running around asking at Yali's Cafe where Warren Hall is. So um, especially if you're some reasonable major, uh, you wouldn't be over here. So I'm going to pass around an attendance list just so we can uh, get a sense of who's there. And it just has the first four meetings. Just check off your name if you're here. If you're not here, don't check off your name, okay? Uh, and if you're a PAX major, put just put a check next to your name on the left. And then there's a second list for uh, wait list. Okay. How are you? Uh, I hope most of you got a couple of course web announcements from me. Did you? Okay. So that did work. Eventually, those of you who like to use course web, not everybody does. <laughs> Um, one, so you, you, you've done that, you have the syllabus, okay? I brought some extra copies. The syllabus is also going to be right in the front of the course reader, which is at Copy Central. But, so, but I'm going to pass these around. They're two pages. What? Hold on a second. Yeah, they're two pages back to back save a couple of trees, but they're not stapled together, so pick two. Um, also, I made an announcement on CourseWeb. I'll be doing that quite frequently when interesting things come up. This was for a film called I Want My Father Back, and the time for that has been changed. It's this Friday from 12 to 2.30. This Friday, 12 to 2.30, it's still in room 20 Stevens. Um, this is probably not going to be a very happy movie, but the relevance of it will be that we're going to be talking a good bit about the struggle for environmental rights, um, particularly in India. There's, I think there's a scene. And uh, this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of globalism from above, globalism from below. And uh, as a result of that, hi Jenna, you can take this chair. As a result of that, a large number of farmers in India are committing suicide. And that's what this film is about. So I'm not saying that this is going to teach you a lot about nonviolence, but it's going to teach you a lot about one of the problems that people have been trying to address with nonviolence. As you've noticed from going through this, the syllabus, we've got a lot of different ways we could have organized the course, and so I decided not to organize it. <laughs> it was just delightful, spontaneous. No, but seriously, uh, I decided a long time ago that maybe the best way to do it was by the type of struggle. So we start off with insurrectionary struggles, which are the most dramatic because they're the biggest, and that's where you have uh, you know, entire nations and entire regimes being overthrown uh, or not being overthrown. So nonviolence doesn't always work, as you know. And um, then we go to struggles that are uh, ref what you might call reform struggles. They're anti-militarist, but they're not aimed at overthrowing a regime. They're just aimed at, you know, reducing militarism or, s or something like that. And then we'll look at uh, globalization itself, which is kind of the matrix and master framework in which all of these problems are happening. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit today. And finally, what is going on, and this is really probably going to be the most exciting and upbeat and fun part of the course, and also the most difficult to, or to get into focus, what is going on in terms of building a nonviolent culture? We're going to be talking today about what people are calling the great turning, some people anyway. Um, it's a struggle that's really taking place throughout human civilization. 
right now. And the progressive people who are trying to make it come out in a good direction, like, might wanna, Mike, why don't you come in the other door and grab this chair? Um, that's what the last part of the course will be about, and that's where I'm going to try and have a lot of guest speakers come in and tell us what they've been doing, and everything from think tanks to you know, new economic practices to um, in struggles of one kind or another. Okay, put on the board something I'm very proud of, which is a new website or a website that's just gotten a new look. And this new look should go live today. So no one, let no one ever tell you this is not an on-time course. There is a chair over here if you want to. You'll be okay. So that's one resource that you will be able to make use of throughout the semester. And in fact, I'd actually like to invite you to be a part of it if there's things. I mean, there's, that this website is for three audiences. Uh, well, it's for the general public, but never mind. It's for activists, journalists, and educators. And I would put most of you probably in the first category. So if there's something that you'd like to know or some mistake that you spot or something like that, let us know about it either by telling me or just by going onto the website, info at metacenter.org, and pointing it out. It's going to have at least one, maybe two blogs, whatever they are. <laughs> no, not that old. And uh, I think in the course of this semester, we'll really be able to build it up into something that'll be useful all over the world. Another interactive kind of resource for us would be a Peace Power magazine, which is produced every semester. It's, I think it's the first student-run, entirely student-run um, news magazine or magazine dedicated to principles not violence. Very handsome. It's, it's going international now. My next semester, it may not be a student publication anymore. So one of the feeds for that magazine is your papers through this course. Other papers that you get interested in writing. Um, there's another resource on the web. I mean, there's lots and lots, of course, and they'll all be on the Meta Center eventually. But we're still going to be looking at Gandhi a lot, and there's a big List serve and resource in comes out of Berlin called GandhiServe.org. And it has the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi online. Now I've been told by Gandhi scholars in India that the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi is maybe three-fourths of the stuff that he actually wrote. There's little pieces tucked away in various little ashrams in India. But anyhow, it's a lot, and the published version in print goes to 98 volumes. So it's not like you'll be lacking for material. And the way you get into it is you uh, go to that particular link for that, I think it's called web book or something like that. You'll, it's pretty obvious on the home page. I love it when people say something on a computer is pretty obvious. <laughs> you never find it. I think this really is pretty obvious. And then you have a search function there, and so you put in a phrase like, um, teaching is not a trade and cannot be practiced as such. So you put in something like practiced as such. And it will give you the titles of the volumes that have that phrase in it. You go to that, and there's another search function which will take you right to that place. So it's an incredibly good way to get to Gandhi material which uh, we're still going to be using. Those of you who don't know who Mahatma Gandhi is, there's a wonderful movie called La Guerra Ho Munabai, uh, which is probably the best Bollywood movie ever made, which is not saying a lot, but uh, it's a lot of fun, and it will introduce you to the way Gandhi is coming back in modern India, which is interesting. So let's see, that is it for the resources. You know that we have a reader 
which I thought I would have copies of in my box, but I, I suspiciously don't have them. So has anyone been to Copy Central? Is our reader ready? I think it'll be ready at 1. 1 o'clock today? Yeah. Okay. I will speak slow. <laughs> but later on today, you'll be able to get that reader, <coughs> and it's organized to the extent that it's organized. It is organized the way the course is organized to some extent, which is by these five <coughs> different types of events. So looking around the room, I can see that about a quarter of you have had Tax 164A. Very good. I refer to them as my A students. <coughs> I don't know why everybody laughs when I say that. <laughs> and they will be a very valuable resource for you when you're panicky about something that I skewed off without realizing that you never heard it before. Take them across the street to Yali's, find out what kind of tea they want, and sit them down and get that information from them. Um, if you have had the A course, you are likely to feel, in a way, a kind of letdown when you start taking this class because we had the great luxury of studying nonviolence as she has spoke. Nonviolence as organized by the great uh, advocates of it, namely Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday we are celebrating today. Um, when things were really kind of uh, as close to the ideal as you're going to get in human life. Case. Not very close. But these were extremely inspiring movements by very charismatic leaders who actually were spiritual figures first before they became leaders of political movements. Uh, most of you know there was one episode where Gandhi was at some kind of a cocktail party or something. That doesn't sound like it was. <laughs> <laughs> he was at some sort of social event and there was a a British prelate there who said, ah, yes, Mr. Gandhi, we're both men of God, aren't we? And Gandhi said, you are a politician disguised as a man of God. I am a man of God disguised as a politician. So don't think that in nonviolence you do not get to tell the truth sometimes when it can really matter. So these are incredible figures. Uh, their like has not been seen again. And we really saw principles of nonviolence in action. Acts 164. It's, uh, it's great. Well, this semester we come down to the real world. This is where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> We're going to be talking about a large number of movements which in my vocabulary, and you will be familiarized with this very soon, they're either constructive program or they're obstructive program, but they're not both. Uh, they're, they're strategic nonviolence trying to become principled nonviolence. You'll be familiar with all of these terms. So I'm just forewarning you that don't expect to find things that are going to be as exciting and rosy and inspirational as they were last semester, but you'll be able to see through the grubby kinds of events that people have had to do, and emergencies and partialities and gray areas. You'll be able to see the force that's working. Okay, so the course has a midterm and a final, and a final paper just the way A does. Um, probably this is a little too early to start talking about the paper. Uh, we'll be giving you some, yeah, in fact, in the course reader, there's a cheat sheet or whatever you want to call it with some tips on how to write a paper for this course. I do not assign topics. You can write on anything, uh, which in a way is not very easy to do. You can write on anything that enables you to explore nonviolence as it has been happening for the last 40 years. I also, I guess I should say at this point that even though we're talking about the nonviolence that's post Gandhi King, in each case we're going to try to get a bit of historical background for that. So we're actually going to be looking back to the World War II era and then coming up very quickly to what's going on today. Um, what I really want you to be able to do by the time you get out of this course is to uh, realize it when you're seeing a nonviolent event and be able to analyze it, and be able to predict this is not going anywhere because they're violating Nagler's law or you know, whatever mistake they're making. 
oh, you know, this is really going to work. This is the one that I want to put my body on the line for. Uh, and, frankly, be able to step up things and tap some people on the shoulder and say, you know what, if you were to do this a little bit differently, you might find it would be more effective. And they would say, well, what are you talking about? And say, you would be able to come back and say, well, look, look at what happened in Burma in 1985. You know, they tried this and it worked. So really, that's what the whole course is geared to. Um, the reason that journalists are one of the main audiences for our website is that they are basically totally clueless about nonviolence. In a way, you could say they're clueless about everything. I have students who be joined uh, the staff at the San Francisco Chronicle, and she shared with me that their motto is, if it's news, it's news to us. <laughs> but uh, here we are in close proximity to New York Gate Hall, and I'm dissing journalists. It's, it's not that they aren't intelligent and idealistic in many cases, but they have never been told that there is such a thing as nonviolence. So they see it happening right in front of them. They do not have a frame, borrowing a term from Professor Lakoff. And they don't know what they saw, and therefore it doesn't stay with them. There was a literary critic many years ago who said, the function of a critic is to fix impressions by naming them. And that's the first step in what we're doing. So you see something going on at any scale. It can be an interaction between you and your roommate, and you suddenly realize, oh my gosh, I've been hanging out with Nagel for so long that I finally did something nonviolent, and guess what? It worked. Um, or it could be a big event, could be something you're even reading about in the news, and you will be able to read between the lines and say, those people do not know what they're describing. And finally, as I say, you might be involved in an event. In fact, some, usually in the spring semester in this course, suddenly half the people aren't there because they just got arrested at Fort Benning or someplace like that. And I'm really secretly proud of them, though I pretend to be a professor. Um, so you actually, will, there's a very good likelihood that you'll be involved in something at some level, and you'll be able to do it more effectively and help your colleagues do it more effectively because of what you've learned. So that's my high ambition for this course. And that's how it's going to work. <coughs> um, there is a fair amount of reading. You're actually slightly in luck because one book went out of print. It happens to nonviolence books a lot. So there's a little bit less than there's going to be. It saves you some time and some money. Um, but do you have any questions now about how the course is going to work? Yeah, John? Are there any Q&As? No, the, the reason that we're in this godforsaken corner of the campus, with apologies to public health students, is that we have absolutely no budget for this course. So we may be able to get a reader on some sort of voluntary basis, but that's not the best to be able to do. In fact, I guess there's a fourth goal for this course, and that is that you go back to your parents and your communities all over California and tell them that tax does not have enough money to operate. Maybe you could get on a motorcycle and ride around and around in Sacramento until you bump into the governor, <laughs> strike up a conversation with him when you're lying side by side in hospital beds. <laughs> Maybe the best way we're going to present our case. So as you, as you probably noticed, the course is being webcast, and I feel very good about that, but there, there's a right way and a wrong way to use the webcast if you're in this course. The right way is if you get deathly ill and there's no possible way to even come to class. Or if I went over something too quickly and you didn't get it. Or you're back home in Riverside and your parents have never heard of nonviolence and you want to show them what you're doing at Berkeley. All of those reasons are very good reasons to look at a webcast. To use it as a reason not to come to class is very bad because, as you'll soon see, even though I'm sitting up here and you're in these rigidly bolted chairs for the time being, the class, class is going to be very interactive. And it's really conversational. If you're not here, you really miss something. Okay. Any other questions about nuts and bolts? Events? Another thing I might repeat, I guess you've probably seen it on CourseWeb or something if you are new in the sense that you haven't had tax on 64A. There are 
uh, there's two good ways that you can catch up really quickly. The book Search for a Nonviolent Future really came out of this course. What I did was I took this course and I retooled it for non-Berkeley students. Not that I have any special fondness for non-Berkeley students, but they are the majority of the population. So I mean, they, they were worth saving also. Uh, and also we have some copies of this very handsome booklet, which uh, you can have for only $5. And of course it doesn't go into nearly the same sort of detail as search. And I'm not saying that the one substitutes for the other, but if you want one of these to sort of get some of the really basics quickly, this would be a good way to do that. It's called Hope or Terror. It was brought out last 9-11 because, as usual, the world, while it was fully aware that it was the fifth anniversary of the recent 9-11, nobody seemed to be aware that it was the 100th anniversary of the birth of Satyagraha in South Africa. So we brought these out, published 6,000 of them, and sent them all over the world, including Minnesota. <laughs> So I think that's all I have to say in terms of resources for right now and in terms of how the course works. Um, Catherine? What's the website to go to see the, um, uh, the Rocky Mountain Oh, website? to see these webcasts, you can, the easiest way is probably to go to the university's website and just put in webcast and then go to Peace and Conflict Studies. As of last semester, this was the first and only PAX course that was being but you'll, you'll see right away whether it's me or somebody else. Up there. But that's that's the easiest way to do it. There is a faster link. I'm sure I can get it. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Um, anything you want to say by way of you know, expectations you might have had when you're coming in here? What are we going to cover? What are we not going to cover? Before I uh, launch into what I want to try to share with you today. Okay, off we go. Uh, if you are a PAX major, you are aware that there are basically two definitions of peace out there in the world. <coughs> there is a negative peace, which simply means the absence of war, and there's positive peace, which means the presence of something else. That breaks down into negative and positive. Negative peace means simply there is not a war going on. So this is a, wherever there isn't a war going on, there is this quasi-peace condition. There could be this terrific injustice, people who hate each other, they're stockpiling arms like mad, um, but it's not in a shooting war, uh, armed conflict isn't happening, so it's not. The, quote, best, as in stupidest definition of peace that I ever heard, which was a negative peace definition, and I think it's, I think it's in my book, Search for a Nonviolent Future, was developed by the U.S. Navy, and the, uh, there's millions and millions of dollars of tax money went into this, I'm sure, and uh, they came up with a definition of peace, which is perpetual pre-hostility. Perpetual pre-hostility. Well... If you can imagine walking across Sproul Plaza and all of these booths, these card tables are set up, and going to one of the evangelical groups and saying, my perpetual pre-hostility I give unto you, you will get a clear sense immediately of the difference between negative peace and positive peace. Negative peace is an extremely uninteresting subject, which is studied by most political scientists. <laughs> Positive peace is a lot harder to define. And the way I define it is a regime in which all parties spontaneously desire one another's welfare. It's, you could also use a Gandhian concept for that, which is heart unity. Heart unity prevails. Heart unity, well, okay. Some of the A folks want to try and define Heart unity. I know there's been a long break in between. <laughs> Joanna, do you remember what it was? Yeah. 
Yes, it, it means that I realize you might not have heard that. I'm going to try and find out if there's a way of shutting this off. <laughs> not violently. <laughs> uh, what, what Joanna said was you know, pretty much starting from what I said, sp spontaneously wanting the well-being of the other person, wanting them, you said to prevail, I would prefer to say to thrive, because prevail means they have to beat me, and I'm not sure I want that, but I want them to succeed at any legitimate goal that they have. And that means that I can have this feeling with them regardless of differences. It's amazing, any kind of differences, including differences of power. They can be in charge, and I could not be. And I still uh, want them to be good duenas, be good, be good rulers, be in charge, good in charge people, and, uh, and do that well and, and be happy. And when to the degree that you have this condition prevailing in any population, I would say positive peace prevails in that population. And that will lead to structural definitions like you know, justice will happen there. So. <coughs> okay. And the other main factor that you learn about peace, if you're a peace and conflict studies major, I hope you do, I hope you don't just learn about globalism, you should also learn that peace is a little bit like an onion in that it has concentric circles. Negative peace folks always start with the biggest circle. There's no armed conflict. We don't have armies on the march. We have peace. But the minute you start looking at positive peace, you see that there are four concentric circles to it, and it actually starts Sometimes three, sometimes four, sometimes five, but you know, who's counting? But it actually starts within the person. You have to be at peace within yourself. You know, if part of you is at war with another part of you, not only are you going to be unhappy, but that's going to spill over into your social environment. And as you know from last semester's brief foray into positive psychology, and this will be website, there's now a huge lot of scientific evidence. And it seems huge if you're not a scientist. Uh, I'm sure to the scientists it seems like just a drop in the bucket. But there's a comfortably large amount of scientific evidence that people influence one another directly before you even get to words and stuff like that. And there's things called mirror neurons, which mean that like if I shrug my shoulders like I just did, the nerves in your upper trapezius muscles fire off. And they say to your upper traps, contract. <laughs> and then something interferes and you say, no, no, yeah, that's his problem. <laughs> I don't feel like shrugging right now. <laughs> so you intercept that process at the last minute, but it happens. And it happens not only with motions, but with emotions. So if I were to say, if I were to start thinking about the tax budget, okay, the next thing you know, I'm blubbering sobbing here. Your whole crying mechanism would kick in physiologically. It would go up to the lacrimal gland and would say, you know, tear. And you might do it. I bet you would, Zoe. <laughs> you either might or you might not, but you are having this reaction is the point. So if you have non-peace inside yourself, you are giving people around you non-peace. Even before you open your uh, and then there's the society, the group around you, and then there's the nation and its relationships with other nations, the nation and the world. And then, of course, there's finally the planet, which we are suddenly realizing is way more important than we thought. Peace with the planet, having it be a piece of us, we could actually survive long enough for you people to finish your PhDs, which at this point looks like it's a little bit in doubt. Uh, okay, so that's peace, and if you come at this as a PAX major, these are the kind of frameworks that you usually are running around in. And parallel way, we have the same thing for nonviolence. There's a You can divide nonviolence into negative and positive. 
And negative nonviolence has a special name, though not everyone in the field would agree with me. And there's five of us in this field. So <laughs> and principle. And so strategic nonviolence means it's difficult. Strategic nonviolence means, okay, I'm not being violent towards you right now. And that usually is defined on the physical level. Okay? I mean, I don't have heart unity with you. I hope you croak. Get out of my face. But I'm not punching you. I'm not even cursing. <laughs> don't worry. This is not the state of mind that I'm in. So just <laughs> by way of illustration. Um, and as long as that's going on, some people say, hey, this is nonviolence. Now, that's a huge mistake. Because this is less than a fraction of 1% of what nonviolence actually is. I'm not saying that strategic nonviolence is a wrong thing to do. If the choice is between strategic nonviolence and violence or cowardice, hey, go with strategic nonviolence every time. But if it doesn't work, don't come to me later and say you want your money back if you pay for this course because nonviolence doesn't work. So in a very parallel way then, principle of nonviolence means where you have the well-being of the other person uh, at heart and you have confidence that a solution can be arrived at such that all parties will have their legitimate needs met. So it's kind of a faith issue, if you will, part of a vision of those parties. And we're going to talk about that more in a minute, but just as we have this set up in peace studies, we have it also in nonviolence, and there's a concept called person power, which was invented by your humble servant, and any of the A folks would like to define what that is? I know you were incredibly good at this about three and a half weeks ago. <laughs> Zoe. Um, uh, I didn't think about what I was going to say. So just just <laughs> blast it right out. Um, personal power is um, defined by um, the ability of a person who um, sincerely is carrying out principles on violence. Uh -huh. Very good. Now I have to repeat everything for the <coughs> webcast, so tell me if I don't get this quite right, but it's the power that an individual person has who is committed to principle of nonviolence and is able to carry that power into a given social situation where there could be a hundred people who are going through the same emotions, but it's not in their heart. They don't really feel this. They haven't had Pax 164. It's not their fault. Uh, the reason that uh, I developed this term was a lot of people were saying that nonviolence is people power as opposed to state power. And the, one of the revolutions that we're going to be studying in this course very soon is the people power revolution that took place in the Philippines in 1986, where on the one hand you have the power of the state, and it is embodied in, the, in its institutions, its uniformed military, its, uh, you know, its homeland security, whatever it uses for this sort of thing. And on the other hand, you have the power of people who last November 7th started to say, hey, we don't want this. And on the 27th of this month, we're going to go to Washington, D.C. and do something about it. And I hope some of you will be there tapping people on the shoulder saying, you're, you think you're in phase one, but you're in phase two. You should be doing this. And so we'll get back to that. Um, but I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that people's power doesn't exist, but um, it ain't nothing compared to person power. And in principles on violence, you have kind of these saying, uh, numbers do not matter. No, that's not totally true. I would rather say there are times when numbers matter, and when you need them, you will have them if you have the kind of committed person that Zoe was just talking about. 
Okay, so we have state power versus people power is very real, very real dynamic. But we're also going to be thinking about person power, which is the incredible power that a single individual can have. We want to visualize it. Just imagine that older man in Tiananmen Square standing in front of that whole column of tanks. Okay, so here's what I'd like to do the rest of today. I'd like to spend some time talking about the basic characteristics of nonviolence, and I'm mainly talking here about principles of nonviolence. And then I'd like to step back. We go 9.30 to 11. Yeah, okay, we'll be fine. Step back and look at the really big picture. What kind of struggle is the world going through right now? And why should we care about it in this course? I think I'm going to end up saying why they should care about us. I think we have a couple of clues that the struggle very badly needs. And then finally, I would like to sketch, and if we don't get to this, it's okay, because there's an article of mine that does discuss it in the reader, which is available 1 o'clock today at Copy Central on Bancroft. Um, I'd like to discuss what nonviolence has gone through as a global movement since the era that we studied last semester, the great era of Gandhi and King, and the scope of it. And you'll be reading an essay by Richard Dietz in, your, uh, in the book called, um, it's a book by Walter Wink. Thanks. What's it called again? Peace, Peace is, is the, the way. way. Thank you. Yeah. Famous statement of uh, A.J. Musty, he was asked, what is the way to peace? And he said, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. So um, in that essay, Richard Dietz points out that almost half the people in the world live in a regime that has been substantially affected by some kind of nonviolence movement. Yeah, starting with India, we have people have something like 800 million people, and uh, you know there were things in China. If you add it all up, and most of this incidentally has happened in about the last 10 or 15 years, more people have than have not experienced nonviolence firsthand in the country that they live in. Not that they know about, it, not that they can give it a name, not that they can explain it, but it has happened. So it's a huge thing, and if we get to it today, if not, we'll get to it on Thursday. We'll talk about what the changes that have happened if you look at this whole thing as a global movement, w which is very, uh, which is a thrilling thing to be able to do this because it never was possible before. You know, when Gandhi happened, and everyone said, "Whoa, what is this? It must be passive resistance." He said, "No, it's not passive resistance." Um, and th the idea of having a history of nonviolence is a very new thing. It's great. There is at least one graduate student history major on this campus right now who is studying nonviolence. Yes. It's a lot more than nothing. Okay. So first, uh, the general characteristics of nonviolence. Looking now at basic characteristics, not at... Uh, rules like uh, non-embarrassment and things like that, which will come up. But basic characteristics, let me put two or three on the board and see if you have others. And this, this is open to anyone, even if you did not have section 64A. I'm going to start with this one. It may not be the most important one, but the funny thing about it is once you adopt it, you are pretty much launched into a nonviolent posture. And that is means and equivalence. Let's call it that. If you do not buy nonviolence, you think that you can use destructive means to bring about a constructive end. We have this wonderful quote, which I shared with you last semester, which is from commander who was in charge of a large section of American military occupation of Iraq. I'm sure he's been rotated out by now because every time the president changes his mind, he, he blames it on his whole staff and rotates them out. Anyway, we, we won't have that on account. 
Anyway, this person said, you're describing their, their mission in Iraq, he said, with enough violence and enough terror and enough money for projects, I think we can convince these people that we're here to help them. <sighs> no, well, maybe the less said about this, the better. <laughs> we're all in a pretty good mood so far. But the fact is, if you believe that in any substantial way, you can use things like violence and terror and get to a positive condition like democracy or peace or people thinking that you're there to help them, well, how shall I end that sentence? I'll just, I'll just very neutrally say, you do not have a nonviolent world. I was going to say, you are crazy. But <laughs> that may be controversial. But the fact is, it is not a nonviolent world. If you, sit, if you do nothing else but believe that in order to bring about a positive end, you need to have used positive means, you're going to have to end up in the nonviolence camp. If you really hold that belief and carry it out consistently, you will, because life is full of conflict and struggle, you're going to find that you are forced to develop nonviolent means to deal with that struggle. And if you really want to understand why these nonviolent means worked and so they weren't just a fluke, then you're going to have to understand the whole belief system. So as I say, this may not be the single most important thing about nonviolence, but in some ways it's the handiest because if you want to get into it with one proposition, I often think this is the one. The second thing I'll put up there, and this, this is again a neighborism. I, I mentioned that I invented these things not because I'm proud of them, which I am, but because I think it's important for you to know that it's not generally accepted in the field. You know, so you're, you're there on this picket line in Washington, D.C., and you say, you guys are doing it wrong. And you say, what are you talking about? Well, this is a violation of work versus work. You have to realize that not everybody uses this vocabulary. It's, it's a new field, and we're inventing it as we go along. And in fact, there's been some suggestion that maybe work versus work is kind of hard to pronounce. And you might want to call it success versus work. But the general idea here is that every action has immediate consequences and long-term consequences, and a lot of stuff in between. Okay? It has, let's say, on uh, raising a child, and the child has done something wrong, I have to discipline that child. <coughs> I can do this in a way which kind of says to the child, I'm surprised that you, this isn't like you, or I can do this in a way that says to the child, there you go again, this is like you, and those two things will both have the same short-term result of getting a child to stop whatever he or she is doing but they'll have absolutely polar opposite long-term results. If I do it the first way, I, I, this isn't like you, I'm so surprised, how can you be doing this? If I do it that way, the child will have internalized the idea that he or she is a good child. If I do it the other way, there you go again, get out of my face, I keep on doing this, I'm gonna have to get rid of you in some way. Even if I don't go that far, that child has internalized the value, the belief that they are a bad person. And I have devastatingly bad consequences when they become a teenager. And I look at them and say, what did I do wrong? How could this happen? You know? This is a characteristic of long-term results, the work that's done on the social field. One of the unfortunate characteristics is you don't see the dots. You can't trace the connection. That really has caused the growth of nonviolence to be very, very slow. So uh, the reason that this is up here on the board at this moment is that in uh, nonviolence, especially in principled nonviolence, if there's faith in both of these. There's understanding that this is more important, and there's a willingness to sacrifice the immediate success for the long-term goal. So the B.R. Nanda, who's a really, really great Gandhi historian, has said what people don't understand about nonviolence is that 
it's the kind of struggle where you can easily lose every battle and still win the war. Because while you're losing these battles, you're putting out another message which your opponent is internalizing that you don't really regard them as an opponent. Okay? So that would be the next characteristic I'd like to put up there. And the third, and I'll stop with these three and see what others you want to add. The belief that um, sort of like what Joanna was talking about with our unity, that there is a solution for everybody. Okay, so let's use this typical social science formula. Win-win is possible. So a situation presents itself to us and it takes on this guise that in order for me to get what I want, I have to keep Yelena from getting it. Okay? That this is not, not the case. But if it were, this would be a win-lose situation. And we would be doomed to perpetual conflict, right? Because the next time Elena would come back and she would know now it's my turn to smash. She would have to. But if we have the faith that there must be a way of working this out such that everybody can have their needs. I'm using that term very carefully because they cannot all have their wants. This is what, where our civilization has gone wrong, We're multiplying wants all over the place. Nobody ends up getting what they need. But we have the faith that there must be a way, in every conflict, there must be a way for all parties. And as Johann Galtung has always pointed out, there's really no such thing as a two-party conflict. He's never met a conflict that had fewer than 16 parties in it. There must be a way for all parties to have their legitimate needs met. So the, the uh, interaction then becomes a, a learning experience, educational experience, and not a fight. It's learning, not fighting. Because if it were the case that it's either you or me, we've got to fight it out. May the better man win. If women ever use that vocabulary. But if it's a case that we both really want, we both need the same thing, but one of us is less aware of it, then the job is to awaken that person. Now my favorite, most dramatic, and most timely example of this, again comes from Johann Galton, who has <coughs> mentioned his name. He is a, <coughs> Alex, are there two names in your one? No, okay. No reason anyway. Uh, his, he has a very, very smart person who got out of academia, or respect for that choice, and has become a uh, world-class conflict negotiator, spent a lot of time listening to people in the Middle East. He didn't have to spend much time listening to people in the West because he knew what they were about. He spent a lot of time listening to people in the Middle East, and he came up with the discovery that what people in the Middle East really, really need is respect for their religion. And what people in the West really, really need is access to their oil reserves. So there is absolutely no conflict. Not only is there not a clash of civilizations, there's not a clash of anything. There's no clash. Well, there really is a clash, of course, but what is it of? It is a clash of egos. There are people saying, in order to get access to your oil reserves, we have to go back to the colonial era, which is over about 100 years now, and reinvent it and have with us on top, and, uh, and absolutely not listening to the needs of the other people. Another good example of this was, um, I can get these figures straight, I'm not a medievalist, but um, one of the kings of France uh, went to the Holy Land and negotiated with the uh, uh, Muslim rulers and came away with this terrific package where 
Christians would have access to Jerusalem, to the holy sites. They would not be uh, harassed or impeded <laughs> with, or interfered with in any way. This must have been Frederick II. This must have been Frederick II around the time of St. Francis, 13th century. Not that it matters for our purposes, but I think truth does help. Anyway, he, uh, he said, you know, you didn't need any crusades. You can go there whenever you want to. Christian monasteries would not be tampered with, which Muslims never did anyway, because they respected, you know, Jesus for them as one of the prophets, and they respected anyone who was leading a religious life. And uh, he came back and said, I did it. You know, I, I opened it up. It's, it, it's all ours. And the Pope did not like him, actually, and they got into serious, serious difficulties. Eventually, he was excommunicated. About 60 or 80 years later, I'll, I'll go back and check these facts. They're probably all wrong, but <laughs> the basic outline of the story is okay, and that's what we needed to be there. Uh, Louis the IX goes there with a huge expedition, uh, and it's total failure. Almost every knight that he brings with him is killed, and Jerusalem shuts down. The Christians can't go there anymore, and when he comes back, he's made a saint. That's why he, they named a city after him in Kansas. So, I well, I'm putting, you know, I tell you this story partly because it infuriates me, but partly because it uh, shows that really a win-win situation was possible, and if people hadn't gone in there egocentrically saying, your civilization is wrong, my civilization is right, I know it's right because it's mine, and we've got to fight to the last man, there would not have had to have been that war. Okay? So there are other there are other factors that we could add, and I'd like to talk it over with you, invite you into this conversation now. What other things do you regard as really fundamental to a nonviolence worldview? Different from the prevailing way of looking. John, do you want to give it a try? Um, I was just thinking Nagler's law, saying that if you want, it's kind of, this is what you need to know, so, uh -huh. but if you were going to have a positive end to any situation, you have to put positive energy into it, uh -huh. and you put negative energy in, and then you don't want to it, yeah. even if you're trying to have a positive end. Yeah. Let's uh, put that, as you say, under means and ends. It's one of the things that, you know, Nagel's Law is sort of a joke. I hope you realize that. Um, though, in fact, if I get the Nobel Prize for this, I won't turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> then, just watch what happens to the budget of peace and comfort states. <laughs> no, this, this states that not only do you need to put positive energy in, but for some funny reason, if you put mixed energy in, you might as well just go with the negative energy. Yeah? I think that Mm -hmm. what you're, what you're yeah, like the law of attraction is like that Larson cartoon where there's this person who's in an orchestra and his job is to beat the kettle drum and he's saying to himself, I won't screw up, I won't screw up, I won't screw up. And the caption of the cartoon is George screws up again. Yeah, whichever kind of energy you use, positive or negative, will tend to draw in more of itself. But for some funny reason, the world is imbalanced such that if you have a largely nonviolent campaign with a little bit of violence in it, the effectiveness is very, very small, and the ultimate result is as if it were a violent campaign. Partly, we describe this as a result of the perception of the campaign by the public, who is not going to see the nonviolence. They'll only see the violence. But partly, I think there's a deeper reason. Yeah. Yeah. What is your name? Tammy. Tammy. Um, I don't actually know anything about nonviolence, but <laughs> give it a shot. Um, I was thinking maybe a sense of being able to accept each other's um, not only differences, but more like things that someone might view as a failure, but first you just yeah. accept yourself. Yeah, I really, I really like that. Being able to accept not only differences, but things that you're damn sure they're wrong but still you can accept them as a person. Okay, I'm going to 
Uh, I'm going to elevate that to a basic principle. Uh, and that is mm, the person is not the problem. Okay? This is actually pretty key. If you can, in fact, I believe that there's uh, a trade-off here such that to the degree that I am aware that you are not the problem you're causing, I am effective in helping you stop causing that problem. Or to put it the other way around, to the degree that I confuse you with your wrong behavior, I will be disempowered from helping you change that behavior. For example, we're going to be talking about a technique This is a public health eraser. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like the social science eraser that we use. Um, we're going to be talking about something called civilian-based defense, which is one of the two ways that you can use nonviolence in large-scale armed conflict. Uh, Shannon, what is CBD in the world? Um, I mean, I guess you could think of Prague Spring. Right? Yeah, like what happened in Prague Spring. How do you define it? Yeah, not, it's, it's, you're, you're starting in exactly the right place. It's disallowing an invasion. We're, we're talking large scale conflict here. And Prague Spring that Shannon mentioned is the, the classic example of this is 1968, 69 in Czechoslovakia, duh. <laughs> Otherwise, why would it be Prague Spring? Uh, where you do not try to prevent the armed force from physically entering your country, but you non cooperate with and this is very effective. It kept the Soviet army, the Warsaw Pact armies at bay for uh, eight months. They planned to take over Czechoslovakia in four days. And um, the, what makes it work is you fraternize with those soldiers and instead of saying, you know, we hate you, get out of here. And we're gonna actually see scenes like this you know, when we look at the Denmark episode in World War II, we'll see that in about a week. a week. Instead, you say, hey, look, you know, we're revolutionaries just like you. What we're trying to do here is build communism with a human face. Why should you be here? And you absolutely not cooperate with them as soldiers, but you absolutely accept them as human beings. So, and that's what gives, uh, gives civil-based defense its effectiveness. So that was very good, Tammy. That's, that's a real underlying principle. Again, it's one of those things which, if you just did this and almost nothing else, you probably could work your way out to a whole nonviolent world. Alex. Um, I was thinking of Gandhi's Law of Suffering. Right. Right. I'm going to unpack that a little bit to make it into a basic principle, but why don't you define it for us? Before um, sorry, it's when in a situation where you're so dehumanized that your opponent isn't seeing as a person anymore, yeah. you can rehumanize yourself by instead of like inflicting harm on them, by like taking yeah. on the suffering yourself. Yes, very good. What Alex said was in a situation where your opponent has dehumanized you to the extent that they're not listening to you anymore, Petitioning them is not going to work. Uh, even if you go online and collect a million signatures overnight, they've already told you they're not listening. They're not even listening to Congress, much less listening to you. Then you, you're not without recourse. You've reached the end of one phase, and you have to go over to a phase where you look around, and there's a lot of suffering in the situation, and you take some of it on. Is this fun? No. We never promised you a rose garden. Nonviolence is very difficult. Obviously, you want to get started sooner before they dehumanize you that badly so you don't have to go through this. 
But the fact is, we will often find ourselves in situations where it's too late. They're not listening with their head. You have to open their heart. That's a little Gandhian terminology. And you do that by taking on, voluntarily taking on suffering in the situation. So you have to be very clear about two things. You are not a masochist. You don't like suffering. You're doing it because you have to. And you're not adding to the suffering of the situation. You are just using it. You're redirecting it. And as Alex said, instead of inflicting it on the other, you're taking it on yourself. And most of the really dramatic examples of nonviolence that we will be seeing and hearing about, <coughs> this is what happened. For example, we'll be seeing very shortly a film about the uh, uh, plebiscite, the, the plebiscite, which vote referendum, I guess it was, which turned um, uh, uh, Pinochet out of power in Chile. And in order to make that happen, people had to take an incredible risk. They had to overcome tons and tons of fear. They have to go out there in the plaza, Plaza de Mayo, and stand there with a little sign saying, where is my son? And uh, when there was only four or five of them, they could be wiped out pretty easily. So I would say this invokes the law of suffering. The suffering in this case was in the form of risk, a risk of physical abuse. OK. Anything else that seems to you? Well, yeah, I said I was going to unpack this a little bit. Um, and I think. What I'm getting at here is that there's a sense in which nonviolence is an attractive, not a repelling force, and therefore, let's see, let's see if we go somewhere else with that. But let's just go there for now. Oh, yeah, 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 I remember. It operates by persuasion, not coercion. These can all be grouped, I think, under the same heading. So this is, incidentally, all these things start to talk to each other. If you're going by persuasion versus coercion, obviously it's going to take longer. So that's where you get over to the work versus work. And you have faith that it's much better to take time to persuade the person of the rightness of your view, which is never in question in the first place, than to force them to behave in a way that you want them to behave, even if they don't believe it. Because obviously, the minute they get a chance to reverse that, they will. Whereas if you've made it their own, if they have made it their own, uh, that won't happen. I was once uh, in a committee on this campus uh, back in the days when I thought, no, sorry, I'm not going to finish that sentence. <laughs> Some time over a, a latte, <laughs> nonviolent equivalent of a beer, <laughs> you get me very sentimental. I'll, we'll talk about this whole situation. But there I was on this committee, and I wanted, uh, I was actually the chairman of the committee, whoever put me in charge of that, I bitterly regretted it. And I wanted uh, things to go in a certain way. and. Uh, it was a reasonable way for it to go. There's one person on the committee absolutely, adamantly opposed to this. And as long as that person was absolutely, adamantly opposed, I did not try to outvote that person, which I, which I could have done. You know, I, Chairman, I got enough votes. I could have said, sorry, Carl, you're outvoted. Ha, ha, ha. You lost. And, uh, something, I wasn't even all that nonviolent in those days, but somehow instinctively, it wasn't out of fear, I don't think, let's say it wasn't out of fear. <laughs> it wasn't out of fear, I didn't want uh, to reach that kind of solution. And then I went on leave, uh, and when I came back, I was off the committee. And I thought, oh, well, that's the end of this, you know, I've lost that. And then I ran into a colleague of mine who had been on the committee with us, and we were chatting and said, by the way, I want to tell you that Carl has now taken over where you left off and he's now advocating me. Well, that's a win-win situation. That's how you like it to go, and that's not, that's not violence. It didn't even require a whole lot of suffering in this case. A certain, certain amount of ego suppression, you know, a little anti-machismo, uh, <laughs> not very significant amount of suffering. 
Okay? Well, unless you've got another one that you think is equally basic that you want to put up right now, I'd like to try and talk about the big picture. Okay. So I think this will be a very good start for us. Um, and I'm not even sure that this next part is going to be all that easy to talk about, but I think we should give it a shot. Sorry. <laughs> I think we should give it a try. <laughs> I mean, you can call me on that back uh, I think I better sit down. How shall I start? There, I'm going to start with a with formula from St. Augustine, strangely enough, in uh, his mighty work uh, written toward the end of the fourth century of our era called The City of God, Kiwitas Dei Contra Paganos, The City of God Against the Pagans. He repeatedly comes up with this formula. It's almost like a mantra, duo amores faciunt duo kiwitas. I'll put it on the board. I feel like yeah. <laughs> uh, literally, that translates two loves create two cities. But you have to realize, first of all, that the city was the largest form of social organization known in the Roman world. The entire Roman Empire was Roman, right? It was not the Italian Empire, or European Empire, the Roman Empire. It was basically one city state expanding its domination over the world. And so he really means the entire world order. And by amor, he means what we would call probably today a drive. So he's saying that there are two drives. He's very much a person power man. That's why I like him so much. There are two drives in every one of us. Um, unless one of them has succeeded in overcoming the other. But the vast majority of us, life is, our inner life is a struggle between two drives. And our outer life is the expression of this struggle. The negative drive, which is the drive towards self, the grand arsenal, blowing up the small <coughs> self to the blocks out everything else, that drive creates these very domineering, disordered imperial systems. I, I hope some of you are frog and toad fans, and you know my favorite frog and toad story is where I forget which is which, of course, the frog is giving the lecture. The same frog says, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest. Every t the audience consists of his one friend, his toad. And every time he says, frog says, I'm the greatest, toad goes back about 10 rows. Until finally he can hardly see him, and he feels very lonely. And he starts developing a whole different kind of discourse. We're all in this together, and I'm not better than anybody else. And every time he makes a statement, Toad comes a little bit closer and they finally get back together. Whole seminar presentations have been given on this story. Uh, so the, this is a pretty cute way of identifying these two drives. And uh, the point is that these really are the two motive forces in human civilization, according to Augustine. And I agree with him, obviously, or I would not have brought him in here. So this struggle that, uh, that's going on in our world today has really been going on since the dawn of recorded history, if not sooner. And it is a struggle between a negative drive and a positive drive. But obviously, it's reached a certain shape, which is kind of new in our world today. And it has also reached a crisis of that I think nobody has any doubt. In the 1970s, uh, there was some forward thinking. People began to recognize this. They had read, we had read, uh, blush, uh, uh, Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions. We used the term paradigm, paradigm shift a lot. And we talked about the dominant paradigm and the emerging paradigm. So we knew perfectly well back then that the struggle was going on. But we didn't have a very good beat on it. We, well, I shouldn't use that. That's also a military metaphor. We couldn't get it into focus. Right? There are lots of elements that were left out. Um, now today, that struggle uh, is being recognized much more broadly. So that's one thing that's happening. 
we were a very small group of random professors. And as far as Berkeley is concerned, there's a little bit, somewhat more in Stanford. Or they always have more certain things. Not the actual. And so there was a few more at Stanford, but you know, the really prestigious places I think had none. Like in Princeton, Harvard, those places. I think it was a good way to lose a job at Harvard if you're thinking in these big picture terms. Um, but the, the group was so small that there wasn't really much discourse. There was no web in those days. You, you remember some huge 75-page documents that you cranked out on these mimeograph machines and carried them around from office to office. And who wanted to read all of that? Um, so it didn't really get off the ground. Now things are different in the sense that it's not the preserve of a few intellectuals in Berkeley. There seems to be a growing, it's not huge, but it's growing worldwide awareness that we are, we're hitting a wall. And that this wall is not just a resource barrier, which is serious enough. I have a friend who lives uh, somewhere in Minnesota, I think, and uh, they were snowed in last winter. And we thought, oh, well, this is fun. Can't go anywhere. I have to trudge around in your big snow boots and uh, ski shoes and stuff. Only they noticed that three days later there was no more food in the stores. And then suddenly it wasn't so much fun. There was only canned goods and things like that. So we're living in a very um, fragile world, which is very resource dependent. You know, over the break, I was down in Nicaragua, and it's always a huge shock to come from a village in Nicaragua to SFO. Everything's so complicated. It's a huge can full of people flying through the air, with, you know, depending on all of these machines and people on the ground and stuff. And it's so fragile because it's so complicated and it's so technology dependent and so resource dependent. Since somewhere in the course of PAX 164A last semester, oil peaked. <laughs> right? So, you know, we're on the downside. But I'm saying that the awareness of this is not just that it is a resource energy problem, but it is an ideology problem. It is a problem of vision. We cannot go on, if we can't go on consuming so much stuff, this means we have to change our whole image of what a human being is. A human being is an open ended stuff consumer, and the more stuff it consumes, the happier it gets. Then this world has been very badly organized, and we're in for some kind of disaster. So, we're being almost forced to confront the spiritual emptiness of material civilization, which is great. It's absolutely great. And this means that there's, there's a dimension. There, there are new conversations going on which are absolutely not possible when I first became aware of this stuff in the 70s. Last July, we put on a conference uh, here at Berkeley called the Spiritual Activism Conference, first annual Spiritual Activism Conference. Uh, Michael Lerner and myself partnered for this. And, uh, it was going to go on in July. Here it was June, and we had like 200 people signed up and sunk all of this money and time and effort into it. Michael, who is much more Jewish than I am, he was saying, if we don't get 500 people, I'm going to kill myself. Very <laughs> Jewish. And uh, the doors opened and 1,400 people walked in. Just nobody would have come uh, 20, 30 years ago. They might have come to a spirituality conference or spiritual activism. Never heard of it, doesn't make any sense. And in many ways, the conversation is opening up in ways which I think are very, very healthy. And we're discovering the reason that it didn't get anywhere in the 70s is that we were just looking at material things and we were not really getting down to what does make a human being happy, which gets down to the question of what is a human being? And what what is ethics based on? In fact, now all of this is taking place in a context of greater 
globalization, and this I'm sure you're totally familiar with, where, for example, I'm sitting in my room. This is a very funny story. I think you deserve a joke at this point. I'm sitting in my room yesterday. I'm supposed to be writing something on the Upanishads, and it's not going very well. I'm at that very awkward stage. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know whom I'm writing this for. It's not coming. I'm staring at my computer. I'm hating it. And my phone rings. Now, the only people who know my phone number are usually people right there in my community. So I thought, you know, I forgot to do breakfast cleanup or something momentous like that. I pick up the phone and the voice says, is this Professor Nagler? I said, yes. And the person said, I'm calling you from Bulgaria. And I want to tell you how much I've enjoyed your writing, especially on the Upanishads. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd like that. But that's not the relevant part. The relevant part, and there is one, the relevant part is you can pick up the phone or you could, you could you know, look at your cell phone and there'll be a text message and it'll be from Amy. She's the only one who text messages me. But theoretically, it could be from my family in Nicaragua or it could be from anywhere. Well, I mean, you, you know this. The world is globalizing. The old containers that hold people are starting to break down. Like the mystique of the nation state is starting to dissolve. So the struggle that's going on now is who gets to pick up the pieces of these broken institutions and who gets to control not just a country, but uh, the, theoretically the entire world. So the old struggle between the negative drive towards self-aggrandizement and the selfless drive towards openness has taken on literally global proportions. And I think that nonviolence is inherently a piece of this in at least two very important ways. One way is, I'll start with the smaller one. I don't think there's any way that this thing is going to be adjusted without a huge amount of struggle. If that struggle is the same old, same old kind of struggle, like is going on in Iraq right now, the destruction is going to be so enormous that I'm not entirely sure we'll get through it. What will, we, what will survive, something like that. If it really comes down to it, where it's like, say, the Global South and its supporters against the corporate networks of the North, and they fight it out with weapons, uh, boy, it's going to be hurt. So to have a different way of struggling, even if you, had no, if you knew nothing else about nonviolence, but you knew it was a different way to struggle, you could have that whole struggle take place and come to a successful conclusion with very, very minimal of bloodshed. Yes, people got killed in India in the freedom struggle, which was the closest thing to a principled nonviolence insurrection that we're going to ever meet with, probably. But how many people got killed? In the Al Ritzar massacre, there were something like 235 people who were killed. Maybe another 40 or 50 people got killed in the whole struggle. Uh, whereas in Algeria, which had uh, a population of 11 million people, 900,000 were killed. Carrying on the same structural, same kind of struggle, but they did it violently, India did it not violently. So if we're going to get through this struggle and come out the other end, it's, we're going to have to fight it with nonviolent means. And that doesn't mean we have to get everybody to agree, by the way. If we do our part nonviolently, that will be enough to change the balance. The other thing I want to say, and I'll just barely mention it because we're out of time, is that I think that nonviolence is actually much bigger than this. Gandhi actually said nonviolence is not the inanity that has been taken for down the ages. Nonviolence is more than just lubricating the wheels of the struggle of globalism. It is defining the goal. It's really pointing us to the world that we want to go to. So we will come back to that toward the end of the semester. Okay, good to meet you all. See you on Thursday.